The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear Do you have any chinks in your spiritual armor? Hello and welcome to the program Words to Live By. In this series of programs we are examining the home and the family. And while this topic is too broad and vast for us to be able to cover every scenario or potential idea for discussion, we do hope to give you God's instructions for the home and family and thus give you words to live by. You can then take these words and use them as your rules and guidelines to follow when making decisions about your own situations regarding the home and family. In reality, the home and family are under attack today. As we have begun to see in our previous programs, there are those who would dismantle the home and family by breaking down God's plan for marriage and God's appointed roles for us in the family and home. We continue looking at threats to the home and family with this lesson called, What David Did Not See From His Rooftop. Keith Mosier will be leading us through the lesson. King David is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, but King David had failures. You might say he had chinks or weak spots in his spiritual armor. What were those chinks and what lessons can we learn for ourselves? In reality, David did some things on his own to lower his defenses or give himself those chinks in his armor. He was doing things that he ought not to have done and it weakened him spiritually. When we are the weakest, that can be when we are most likely to fall into the trap of temptation. You remember when Jesus had been in the wilderness 40 days and nights without eating, he was hungry and probably hungrier than you and I have ever been. It was then that the devil came to him to tempt him. His first temptation played off the hunger of Jesus. The devil said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well, Jesus might have made the stones bread to feed his hunger, but he did not have to do it to prove that he was the Son of God. Even though he was weakened with hunger, he went to where he should have gone for fulfillment and support, the Word of God. But did you notice that the devil did not come and tempt him during the first day, or second day, or even thirtieth day? The devil came to him when his defenses would be at their weakest. But Jesus prevailed, and the devil fled. David did not always do so well. As Keith Mosier will point out, David had done some things that had left himself with weak spots in his spiritual armor. Now he is going to face temptation and not do as well as Jesus did. In these programs on words to live by, we have been looking at the home and family. So you might be wondering, what does the example of David's failure and his weaknesses in his spiritual armor have to do with the home and family? Well, we have been looking at threats to the home and family. So what would happen if we do things to weaken our defenses or make chinks in our spiritual armor? We will be more susceptible to temptation. And how many temptations must we give in in order to destroy the home and family? Sometimes it may only take one. Therefore, it is so important to the home and family that we constantly keep ourselves on the right track and keep our defenses built up. We have already seen in a previous program that the world will not stop attacking our home. There will never be a time where we can just relax and say nothing will threaten my home and family. So therefore, we always have to be keeping ourselves pure and on the right track in order to keep our defenses up against the threats to the home and family. If we can look at the life of David and learn from his mistakes, then maybe we can learn what to do the easy way. But if we do not study where he went wrong and try not to repeat his mistakes, then we may learn the lesson of failure the hard way and too late. And this could lead to the destruction of our home and family. This will be a two-part lesson. Keith Mosier will talk about some chinks in David's spiritual armor. Then in our next program, Keith will mention the consequences of sin. And we can see what it did to David's family. Open your Bibles and study along with us now as we examine what David did not see from his rooftop. I don't know what to tell you to do tonight because this is the most unusual subject I've ever been given. But I would invite your attention to the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel. We might could take a look there and get something out of this, what David did not see 
from his rooftop. I will suggest to us tonight that the Bible never flatters its heroes. All the men and women of Scripture have feet of clay, and when the Holy Spirit paints a picture of their lives, He's a very realistic painter. He doesn't ignore, He doesn't deny, He doesn't overlook their dark sides. No sin that I know about, except maybe the one that committed by Adam and Eve, has received more press than the sin of David with Bathsheba. Hollywood has made many movies, but they always convey David as a sex addict or a pervert, uh, someone with uncontrollable animal-like uh, vices. That is not true. The way that Hollywood pictures him is far from what the Bible says. David was a man who loved God, but David sinned. And he sinned by being disobedient to God Almighty. But you and I sin. The reason we don't think about it the way we think about David's is we haven't received the press he did. We don't have the coverage in Holy Writ that David got because of his sin. And certainly we're not in the political position he was when he committed what he did. He would later come to regret this sin with bitter tears. And you and I know the experience of that also, I'm sure. Let me give us the dark backdrop to this situation, and then maybe we can figure out what it was that he did not see. David is now about 50, maybe 52 years old. He had been on the throne in Israel for about 20 years when the war is going on and Joab, his general, is fighting it. David had distinguished himself by this time as a composer of psalms, a man of God, a faithful shepherd as a boy. He was a valiant warrior on the battlefield, a killer of giants. Uh, he was a leader of his people. He led these people in righteousness for the most part. Um, he was the one who took in Mephibosheth, you remember, and helped him and demonstrating grace and great honor by helping that relative of Saul's. So we look at this segment in David's life, and we know that we're not examining the life of some sexual pervert, some wild rebel. That's not what we're seeing here. He fell into a period of sin, and what he didn't see was the devastating consequences of what he did. He couldn't at the time see the results. But let me say clearly, sin always has consequences. It always has consequences. When I'm in my 50s or 60s or 70s or my teen years or when I'm 20, 30, or 40, sin has consequences. No one is too young or ever gets too old to fall away from God and to fall into God's grace. And so the background is a dark moment in an otherwise distinguished life, the life of King David. Let me suggest something else as background to what we're about to suggest. What happened to David wasn't a sudden thing. If you'll look over there at 2 Samuel 5.12, there were some chinks already beginning to form in David's spiritual armor. He realized, this text says, that God, Jehovah God, had established him as the king over Israel. And David also knew that God had exalted David for the people of Israel's sake. Now David understands that. Clearly, he knows that God had given him a privileged position, that he didn't achieve that himself. He realized that the hand of God was on him. He realized how abundant the blessing of God had been in his life. He says so in that text. But he began to neglect his private life. Look at verse 13. 
David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. He's got a chink in his spiritual armor. The blessing of God was on him and on his people. The decisions he was making as a leader had been blessed by God. And here he goes and does something that God said through Moses was never to be done by an Israelite king. If you'll go back to Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, you'll find out that when they came into the land, Moses said, you could have a king. You know, when they asked Samuel for a king... That would not have been a sin, but what kind of a king did they ask? They wanted a king like the nations. And that's exactly what they got in David. David will think that he has the power of life and death like a pagan king. Where did it start? He multiplied wives, which God said was not to be done by an Israelite king. He couldn't multiply horses. He couldn't multiply silver and gold. He could not multiply wives. David did that, just like a pagan king. Sadly, he's in now direct contradiction of Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17. When you enter into the land, which the Lord your God shall give you, and you say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations who are around me, what you, the kind of king you can have, he says, must be spiritual, not pagan. They could have had a king, a king who every day studied the word of God, a king who led them spiritually, but they could not have a warrior king, a pagan king. And that's exactly the kind of king David became. God said, don't multiply those wives. David did that. And someone says, well, this guy's got a harem full of women. Surely his passion should be satisfied. My doctorate is in behaviorism. And I know from my internship that the more you involve yourself in that activity, the less satisfied you are. David's passion was increased by the harem, not satisfied. His libido was not decreased, but increased by this activity. One of the lies of secular society is that if you just satisfy this drive, then you'll be all right. That's a lie. Do you remember when the woman at the well was told that she could have living water? How excited she got because what happened? Every time she came to that well, she had to keep coming again and again and again and again because she could never be satisfied with one trip. I remember the first TV set I ever saw. It was about that big around. 1948. Looked like an oscilloscope. The first thing I ever saw on it was wrestling, as you say down here, wrestling. But it was really wrestling, Michael. They were actually wrestling. But that kind of thing doesn't satisfy after a while because it's a worldly thing and you have to keep coming back and back. So what is wrestling now? How has it expanded now? What does sin do to you? It makes you want to do it more and more and more. And you have to get, what do they have to do now? Don't they have cage fights? And, oh, I don't know. I don't watch. It's obscene to me, but, so I don't watch it. But they've gotten to where it has to be more and more and more and more and more and more excitement because it's worldly. I remember a sermon C.W. Bradley used to preach called Watch Your W-R-E-C-K-A-T-I-O-N your recreation, because if you get involved in some things, it will wreck you, because the world doesn't satisfy. Now, while I'm thinking about this harem of David's, who in the world in the kingdom can blow the whistle on this guy? 
Look at his track record. Humble beginning. Whenever Samuel went looking for the, a king, he's out, David is, tending the sheep. He's a giant killer. 20 years, sterling leadership. Put choice men in the right places. One of the greatest generals that uh, Israel ever had, David's general. He had a military foe that people around him respected. He had expanded the kingdom to nearly 60,000 square miles. Solomon took it to 66. He had not been defeated. David hadn't on the battlefield. He was exporting and importing. He had financial health. He had built himself a beautiful new palace. He had made plans for the temple of God. Who could point a finger at that guy and say, David, what you're doing is wrong. Can't have all those wives. So what if he married a few more women? So what if he privately increased the number of his concubines? Look at all the good he's doing. David never saw that. And like the politicians of our day, for some reason, people who are somewhat successful in leadership are never questioned as to their morality. And that's the fault of the people. That's our fault. We should point the finger at those people and say, that's wrong. And there's going to be a prophet in Israel who has the courage to tell that king, you sin, David. But at this moment in his life, David is so powerful that a few more women, surely that won't be a problem. Look at already I've, how many I've already had. He taught his son the same thing, didn't he? How many did Solomon have? 700 concubines and 300 wives? One's too many, Michael. One wife, I meant. Well, it's not too many, it's enough. It's enough, Dorothy, not too many. Call me on that. So what, David? Where is your heart? You remember what those wives did to Solomon? They did the same thing to David. He couldn't see it. They turned his heart from Jehovah. They turned him away. And they made him vulnerable. If you want to check this, read chapters 5 through to 12 and notice Everything's successful. But when you get to chapter 12, his success hits him right in the face. His problem hits him right in the face. David is at an all-time high here. He's fresh off a series of battlefield victories. He's at the peak of his public administration. He has all kinds of money, incredible power, remarkable fame. If, he had a, if I had a chart here, I'd just draw his success straight up. And he never saw what it was doing to his heart. He couldn't see it. He's too successful. Do you know when the most difficult time for us is? Not when things are going hard. Whenever our grandson became ill and we knew he was going to die, we prayed. I mean, we hit the floor. But when times are easy and good, sometimes we forget. And that's the thing I admonish me about the most, Keith. Don't you forget to pray. Hard times create people who are dependent on God. That's what it's all about. Dorothy wanted me to plant a willow tree in our backyard I told her it would be no, too much work, and so we got the willow tree. Like that picture window I told you about that was too expensive, and we got it anyway. And I planted that thing, and sometimes when I plant things, they don't live very long. And that willow tree, for some reason, had a problem with it. It must have come from the nursery that way because it couldn't dig its roots in the ground. When the wind blew, it blew it over. But most willow trees, when the wind blows, they wiggle those roots and they get deeper. 
And that's the same thing with us if we are right with God. Hard times make us dig deeper into Him. But when it's the case that we're full of success and pride sometimes, like David, we forget. You know when you first got that promotion at work or maybe you were successful in some way or you've had a spotless record and you're driving for months and years, sometimes it goes to our heads. David couldn't see that. He's successful. He's a winner. And he's going to commit a huge sin. He's vulnerable now. It's at this point in his life when he's most vulnerable, that David's in his bedchamber. Read verse 2 with me. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw. Brother Wood said we always tell what he saw. But he certainly couldn't see the consequences. He saw a woman washing herself. Now, I want you to be very careful with the words here. And the woman was, underline that next word, very beautiful to look upon. I wonder what that bedchamber of David's was like. I picture it as having a lot of ornate wood, maybe oak, I don't know. Framing the windows. It is springtime. The rainy season's over in Palestine, in what we call our fall. Usually there are warm breezes blowing at this time of the year, and here's David in his bedchamber. Maybe he's got some drapes hanging over his windows. He's a king after all. Stars are beginning to twinkle in the sky. <laughs> and David is in bed. And do you know where he should have been, Michael? Read verse 1 with me. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him. You know why the Holy Spirit tells us that? David wasn't where he should have been. David should have been out there leading that battle. Where was he? In bed. There are chinks in David's spiritual armor here. He's becoming vulnerable, lazy, if you will, less than excited about going to battle. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. David was in bed. Had he been where he belonged, we'd never read this account. And husbands, if we'll stay where we belong, we won't read an account about this either. In our own lives. David had some chinks in his spiritual armor. He took more wives and concubines and neglected his private life. He also did not stay where he should have been. David ended up giving in to temptation and committing adultery. If you think about it, not only was David's family damaged, but the family of Bathsheba and Uriah was damaged too. And it only took giving in to one temptation to send David down a pathway of more sin and family problems. We must keep our defenses of the home and family up and stay strong spiritually. The world will never stop attacking the home and Satan will never stop trying to tempt us into sinning against God. We need to be where we need to be doing what we need to be doing. We need to be watchful and wary. The devil is cunning and the temptations will usually not come with a large trumpet blast and an announcement that you are about to be tempted. Instead, it will come softly. It might be something someone says, something you see, some place you go, even by accident, and there will be temptation in front of you, ready to lead you down the path of sin. It may only take one surrender to temptation to damage your home, and your family. Well, even though we are looking at the physical home and family during the course of these programs, we're going to mention the spiritual family. The most important family of which you can be a member is the spiritual family of God. 
When we rebel against God's laws and do things our way, it's sin. And the punishment for that sin is death or separation from God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life instead of the death we deserve. Jesus, who is God, came down to earth and lived a sinless life and then gave himself as a perfect sacrifice of death to pay the penalty of sin for all mankind. If we accept that sacrifice on our behalf and have our sins washed away, we can return to God's presence after this life is over. In fact, we can become one of God's children. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, we read, God has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. It was because of Jesus that the adoption into the family of God is possible for us. In order to accept the sacrifice on our behalf and wash away our sin, we need to follow God's plan of salvation. First, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for our salvation as a perfect sacrifice for sins. Next, we need to repent of our sins. In other words, stop rebelling against God and be willing to follow His ways. We must turn away from our old life of sin and turn to follow Christ. Then we need to confess our belief in Christ before others. That's simply stating you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Next, you need to be immersed in water, baptized, in order that you might wash away your sins. Just as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, so you too must die to your old way of sin, be buried under water, and rise to walk a new creature. Finally, you must live faithfully following Christ and His commandments. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, we read, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. For continued growth, study the Bible, God's Word. You can also take advantage of our materials to aid you in the study. Feel free to use them on our website, www.truthfortheworld.org. There you can find tracks, articles, a Bible correspondence course, as well as radio programs to hear, and TV programs like this one to watch. Well, be sure to be with us next time. We're going to continue our study on the home and on the family. Keith Mosier is going to be back again with us for the next part of this lesson called What David Did Not See from His Rooftop. Please join us then. For now, we ask you to continue reading the Bible as God has given us words to live by. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World. P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Day by day and with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear.